South won the war. That's right. This is something it's... you want to keep under your hat when you're ready Seems to Seems like pretty big news. No, no, whoa, get up, get up. Oh, no, 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 no. I know it's free, but it's freezing in here. I got it, I'm in a, a, like a studio apartment situation. <laughs> Any one of you who are out there thinking that you can't make a movie because nobody is um, stepping up to the plate and giving you money and telling you and giving you permission to do it. You can, you can do it. You can empower yourself, you can pick up a camera, you can get your friends together and you can make a movie and you should do it. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Filling the Void. Um, joining me is uh, Ben Andrews and Genevieve Trainer. Uh, this week's episode is going to be epic. Um, we have the business of story, what screenwriters, filmmakers, and actors need to know. And um, it's just going to be a great show. We'll get into our guests in a few minutes. Um, before we do so, though, uh, the world lost such a creative talent uh, from Seattle. And, um, you know, on behalf of AFMX, uh, the entire Albuquerque and New Mexico film industry, um, we just want to uh, express our condolences to all the friends and family of Lynn Shelton, uh, who was such an impact to so many people around the world um, in so many ways, uh, as a writer, director, um, just overall artist and creative, um, more so in the Seattle area, that's where she was from, but certainly everybody knew who Lynn was, um, the films that she made, and um, you know just everything she did to kind of lend a hand to women in film, um, you know the impact she had there, and just anybody who was in the industry. Um, just want to make a quick mention that um, Northwest Film Forum this evening they're going to be streaming Lynn's debut feature, "We Go Way Back," uh, tonight at six p.m. So visit Northwest. Uh, film Forum. It's uh, nwfilmforum.org, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time. You're able to watch your feature uh, film. Um, I just want to say a quick thing before I introduce uh, Genevieve to talk uh, a little bit about Lynn. Uh, I had met Lynn in 2014 um, at Sundance Film Festival. Um, I happened to be at an event with Robert Redford and Lynn, I forget what actor she was with. It was uh, with a film that she had in the festival. And um, she was walking by and she said hi to Bob and he pulled her aside and introduced me to her and simply said, you know, keep an eye out for this woman. She's going to be one of the top filmmakers in the world. And, you know, Redford doesn't say anything without sincerity. So when he said that, you know, it was just so nice to meet her. And uh, the smile that she had was just infectious. She showed a genuine interest in everyone around her. Uh, turns out later on, I was at the uh, Sundance uh, the Sundance um, Lounge, and somebody else introduced me to her. Oh, you need to meet Lynn. And then uh, later that night during the movie, when we all arrived, she was there, and some, somebody else said, oh my God, have you met Lynn? You need to know Lynn. And um, you know, it was just kind of a joke between the two of us, where it was like, oh no, we haven't met before, when we had actually met the night before. So, you know, that's all I have on Lynn. Um, you know, definitely a great talent that'll be missed by the world. Uh, Genevieve, you know, a few words that you want to say? Yeah, um, thank you, Ivan. Uh, I have only met Lynn one time. I was really pregnant and this was a few years ago and I was uh, helping her as a reader for one of her projects and she was just such a graceful person and so welcoming and you just really felt like you, you, like you mattered and I have no doubt that she treated me just like she treated Robert Redford or you because that seems to be the kind of person that she was and 
doing some more research on her, her projects, it's um, the amount of connection that she had with people and how much she valued everybody on her crew and how she knew the grips names and everybody involved and how she brought the actors into the development process. I, I kept reading how those things were unconventional and how she directed her first film, which is the one that's screening tonight through Northwest Film Forum, we go way back at the age of 39 and how unconventional that is. But I think what is most important important to me, you know, is this, this idea that she lived her life on, on her terms and she valued everybody and what made her unconventional is I feel like what, what we all, you know, can take away from this in terms of treating everybody as valuable people and valuing connection and floundering and, you know, the necessity of floundering in life until you figure it out. So um, I just, for me personally, I hope the be able to take that away from from my brief experience knowing her and her work yeah i appreciate that and you know as everybody knows it's watching from around the world you know you have these filmmakers that are from your city or your state that you know are really successful um personally whether it's the indie world or major features and um you know, you take pride in that, you know, everybody takes pride in that, we're in that city, you know, we have it here in Albuquerque with certain filmmakers and, you know, Seattle, um, you know, definitely has so many creatives up there. You know, Ben, um, you know, you're not going to be hosting today, Genevieve's going to be the co-host with me uh, later on in the show, but, um, you know, you knew Lynn and she had a major impact on Seattle Film Summit as well as you personally, so, you know, let, share, share what you want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, too, for hosting this week's episode. It's greatly appreciated. I, I kind of forced my way into this episode because I, I felt this obligation to just say a few words. So thank you for letting me step in. Uh, my first experience with Lynn, and I was never super close with Lynn, but my first experience was uh, the first film I ever did was directed by one of her students. And at the premiere, I met Lynn and after the film and it wasn't a great film and it wasn't a great performance, but I will, <laughs> I will always remember how kind this woman was in telling me that my performance was not that great. It, it, was, it was just this, it was a critique, but it was, it was an elevation, right? And Lynn was that type of woman that, not just woman, that type of person that when you met her, you knew you were in the presence of somebody that was special, that brought light to a room. Uh, fast forward in 2013 is when we started the Seattle Film Summit, 2013, 2014. Lynn was always a panelist for us, I think in those first couple of years. And if she couldn't do something, she wouldn't just stop it, I'm sorry, I can't do this, but she would reach out to her network and make sure that somebody could backfill uh, if she couldn't do it. And, and all through the years, we'd randomly have, you know, industry conversations or talk about the summit, things like that. But uh, there's, there's a video at the end of today's episode that I want everybody to watch too, that really embodies who she is. And that is as simple as what you, Ivan and, and Genevieve have already said, is that she's one of those humans that just elevated people around her. And uh, that is, not as common as it should be in this world. So we have lost somebody great. Uh, and uh, whatever journey she is on now, I'm sure she will light that path also. But um, thank you guys for letting me say a few words. Have a great episode. And uh, thank you guys for watching. I've been seeing you all in the chat. Jerry and Nadine and Kira. And there's a whole list, Marissa. So thank you guys for sticking in with uh, filling the void with us during this quarantine journey a great episode Bye, man. Mm -hmm. wow so thank you for that ben and uh really appreciate it uh, you know let's get into the show um you know this is dedicated to lynn so it's, i think it's perfect that we have um the guests that we do have on they're impactful to the industry um you know we have christopher lockhart um story editor at william morris endeavor uh, Joshua Michael Stern, writer, director, producer. Um, we also have Jonathan Kesey, screenwriter. 
with the WGA and, um, you know, I, th I think we should just bring them on and get the, get the show started. First, I want to um, thank our sponsors for this show. We have um, Bigfoot Green Room and Eventive. So Eventive is our ticketing agency for uh, AFMX. And, um, you know, really excited about the online platform that they are uh, providing for us for this year's festival. So, you know, away we go. Genevieve, are we ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Let's uh, welcome in Joshua Michael Stern, Christopher Lockhart, and Jonathan Kesey. That's okay, right. Josh. Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. Doing great. Doing great. So happy you could be with us today. Um, you know, Josh and I go back, God, 15 years, 16 since, years? Uh, since I did sw uh, Swing Vote. Yeah. With, yeah. with Costner. Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, here in uh, Albuquerque and throughout New Mexico. God, what right. a production. I mean, yeah. And, you know, that was a great time here in New Mexico film, too, you know, where uh, you had Swing Boat going. I think uh, Love and Dancing was here and a bunch of other productions as well. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, just the energy flow and how busy it was is really cool. And, you know, now we sit here in our living rooms and dens and home offices, you know, waiting for things to open up again. So <laughs> very strange. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's weird right. to be in a world where you have to use your imagination to figure out how a production will be occurring. You know, the smallest thing we took for granted, you know, the hardest thing used to be to get a, a movie or TV say, series made, bought, made, developed, and then shot. And now it's the hardest thing is to simply imagine how you're going to do it if you were to sell it and make it, you know, get it bought. Yeah. yeah, and I was uh, I saw the uh, live stream, the Zoom stream with uh, the governor Newsom yesterday, yeah. uh, with some industry leaders, and it was interesting what they had to say. So they plan on rolling out their guidelines, I guess, on Monday. So we'll see how that goes, you know, for everybody in the in industry. I know everybody's kind of, you know, really anxious and chomping at the bit to get back to work. Yeah. But um, you know, reason we're here today is to talk about you know screenwriting and filmmaking and actors and what they need to know. And you know, your experience, you know, to me is just I think you have great experience in the industry. You know, on writing, producing, directing, you know, getting financing for your projects. Um, you know, you did jobs, and you know, it, it was you know, jobs to me was just such a great great film ashton kutcher josh gad jk simmons you know getting them together to make this a really great um movie about steve jobs you know mm -hmm. we mentioned swing vote previously never was you know is on your resume um you know graves you know the tv show graves is really fantastic um you know I think what you have to offer and you always do candidly, honestly, for people that ask your opinions about things is so appreciated. And wow. I know that the uh, viewers today are going to learn a lot. So welcome to the show. We're going to introduce the other guests and then we're going to jump right into the topics at hand. Great. Thank you, Griffin. It's good to be here. And then we have, of course, we have Christopher Lockhart on Zoom as well. And Christopher, uh, I like your glasses. You Thank were you. with the Seattle Film Summit back in November when we could all meet in person <laughs> way back in the day. <laughs> um, so Christopher Lockhart has been really involved with the Seattle Film Summit and is, uh, he leads a group called the Inside Pitch, which is a 12,000 member strong closed group for screenwriting. And it's remarkable to me how, how in how much you give to the people in the group and there are 12,000 people and you're always, you're always there for ad advice for, for the writers in the group. And it's, uh, it's, it's just highly valuable to them. And as uh, Ivan mentioned, you're the, this, the, the story editor for William Morris Endeavor and you have a really unique position in the industry. I uh, work working with Denzel Washington and a lot of other A-listers to uh, essentially help match projects to them. So if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that and then we can get kind of get started on what a day looks like for you both since we're already sort of headed in that direction. So Christopher, if you wouldn't mind yeah. giving yeah. a little information on what you do. I think you explained it very well. So uh, I'm kind of a matchmaker. So I just try to match projects with actors and I work with a hand 
you know, a handful of them, maybe like a dozen or so. And uh, they're all A-listers. And I've been doing it for 22 years. I started at ICM with uh, working alongside an agent named Ed Lomato. And we had clients like Mel Gibson and Michelle Pfeiffer and Liam Neeson and Robert Downey and uh, others who are escaping me. And then I went to William Morris. And then of course the merge occurred between William Morris and Endeavor. And now I'm at WME, actually at home right now at WME. Uh, and um, so, yeah, you know, I've been reading scripts for many, many years. I've probably read over 60,000 screenplays uh, and uh, I helped to develop. I help to, uh, I serve as a liaison often uh, between the filmmakers and the talent, if there's creative issues, uh, and uh, I'll work in the editing room. Uh, I'll go on location. Uh, so it's 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 a it's a very odd job. It's 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 almost like being a, a development executive and a producer uh, uh, and a dramaturg all rolled into one, working at a talent agency. Great, thank you. So what, what does a day look like for you both right now? What's a, if there is a typical day, what is that? Well, right now I'm actually, um, I'm EPing a TV show uh, for CBS All Access, which is a gig that uh, they called me up to come on to help supervise. And uh, so we actually are working from home on Zoom and, when you're working on a TV show, there's a writer's room, obviously, as I did on my show Graves with Nick Nolte, which was some, which we did somewhere else. And you're, you know, you're, you're, you're in a room with writers, and you're breaking stories, and you're trying to, you know, pitch out and arc out a, a, a whole season. And then, but now it's doing the same thing, but on on this platform, which is interesting because trying to come up with story and idea for um, a TV series, looking into a into a computer screen is such a different experience than being in front of my writers where we can actually talk and there's human connection and you can inspire each other and there's 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 a there's a human element to that where where with zoom it's it's just really strange but but that is what we're doing i mean you know i mean and i'm you know i i'm pitching but i'm pitching on zoom as well and i'm working on things so as much as you're doing, a lot of people are doing very little because it's, you know, things are a bit of, you know, everything's sort of on freeze, but that's, that's how I'm, that's what my basic day right now it looks like. So pretty similar to before, but all on Zoom and more discombobulated. And in writing, you know, I mean, the good thing about being a writer is you do, when you're off writing, we're off writing, you are in the basic environment that you were in before, you know, which is that you're in a room writing on a, on a computer and mm -hmm. uh, on the things that I'm direct, everything that I'm directing is on hold, you know, that's that's the other part of it all, you know, um, but but uh, it is it is a, a strange new world and, and we'll see we'll see how it, it progresses. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. What what about you, Chris? What are you what are you up to? By the way, just so you know, I'm texting with Jonathan Kesey. So <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. he's having some yeah, technical issues. It's, okay. He, he thinks maybe he's having a bandwidth issue. So he's uh he's trying to get on at, at least. With perfect, perfect uh segue from what <laughs> what Josh yeah. was saying. It's exactly what it is. It's every day. Let me in, let me yep. in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's uh, right now things have kind of ground to a halt. At a talent agency, obviously, there's a lot of ways uh, uh, for an agency to work. We, we're just not in the movie business. There's obviously podcasts, there's publishing, uh, but the live events business is certainly hurt. Uh, and clearly, without production, uh, there's not a, a, a whole lot to do. I'm certainly not as busy as I was let's say last year at this time, but uh, I'm still doing a lot of reading because when this is done, uh, Matt Damon and Christian Bale are gonna have to go to work. And so, you know, we're still trying to find stuff for them. We just put uh, Nick Cage in uh, the Tiger King, uh, you know, uh, the scripted version of that. So uh, we're still busy, but you know, clearly, uh, I'm here, I'm at home. And so most of my day is just reading. I'm just, 
I sit in a chair by an open window, like an old man, uh, and I read and I doze off. <laughs> I wake up and I read and I doze off. That's just most of the day right now. When you're when you're looking at scripts, are you are you finding that the, the scripts you're looking at are different? Like you know, with less smaller roles, less day players, less extras. Are there are there changes in the scripts that are? There is a lot of talk about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did just very recently read a script by an A-list writer director who uh, plans on shooting it. It's one location, two characters. Um, so there's uh, some effort in that, but I think I'm still seeing stuff that was written pre-quarantine and that's the stuff that's coming into me. Maybe in a few months, I'll start to see more of, you know, these kind of COVID projects. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. There's Keezy. Yeah, our, our, he's frozen. Oh. I think. <laughs> you know something? Actually, that's usually what he's like. <laughs> he's just usually like that. Well, if you can hear us, Jonathan, welcome yeah. to the conversation. Hopefully it unfreezes and uh, we'll start getting questions your way too. Um, wanted to, you know, kind of dive into some topics. Um, you know, this episode's focus on the development process and what all screenwriters and filmmakers and actors need to know about it. Um, you know, the three of you have had a great deal of experience in what it takes to turn scripts into financial projects, like get them made. You know, what, um, what's the top difference between getting something greenlit <laughs> or not greenlit, you know, and what do you see that? All right, can you hear me? You sound Thank drunk. You. And frozen. <laughs> that was a great movie, by the way, Frozen. My kids love it. So getting back to the question, yeah. what, what yeah. do you feel the difference is, um, you know, right now and getting something greenlit and, you know, getting it made, you know, I mean, are, are people, financiers looking at projects right now? Um, you know, Josh, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's changing very fast. Um, I had been with a project that I was going to direct last fall with, well, not so long ago, actually, with uh, Robert De Niro and, and that sort of fell apart. But, you know, part of that experience really illuminated of the issue of what's going on for the independent world right now, which is that the theatrical, you know, road is, is much more narrow for things like dramas or smaller comedies, you know, uh, and the paradigm which used to exist, which was a foreign value sale kind of pair, you know, quotient. When I, you, you attach an actor that has a certain value that equates a certain, um, you know, uh, budget for the script that you wrote, um, that world is changing because the level of actor that you need is just exponentially grown bigger to, the, to what a budget can hold, especially in the world of a drama um, uh, in that eight to $10 million range, you know, under five in, in genre films is easier. So, I, I mean, I think the game is always that you, it's always about the material, you know, it's always about the script. I mean, if you have right now, the good news is there's so many places for these scripts to live yeah. and to exist in. And if you have a good piece of property, a good, you know, good material, it, you know, I always feel it'll, it'll find a home somewhere, you know, and, and it may take a little while and it be maybe a little less part of the equation that used to exist um, where, uh, but it, it also might, I mean, I know somebody who just attached a very large actor to it, to a script, uh, but, but, you know, Netflix and all, and all of these streaming services, are occupying so much of the oxygen and and there's such you know and there's synergy between them and and even weirdly when I was working with De Niro for that even though for that period of time you know the Irishman had come out and it was a very interesting moment because you know Netflix pulled it from a, a, a wide theatrical and that was a hundred and fifty four something million dollars it was it was a it was almost surreal because it felt to me like the first time a major film that I would have considered to be a theatrical shoe in at that budget level with that cast, what in essence, in essence but to the streamer and, and you know, was pulled. So I think in the end, it's all about getting that script as good as you can get it. And so that when it gets to Greg and when it gets to people, they they really can envision and they really see it as a match with with 
with the talent that they're they're representing and that they're packaging it with and um, which the packaging is a whole other thing that's being upended. You know, I'm, you know, I was with uh, WME right before the whole uh, uh, WGA, you know, walkout thing. But, but, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a interesting, I'm, I'm rambling, but it's an interesting world, but it's also a world that's very much the same. If you have a really good piece of material, a really good actor is going to do it and a really good director is going to want to do it. That hasn't changed. You know, stories haven't changed. Storytelling hasn't changed. Being, you know, that is what people should really be um, um, heartened by, that that is always going to remain. Yeah, let me, let me, so last week we had Stu Lyons on, um, you know, the executive producer of Better Call Saul and, you know, many other projects, along with um, Sheila Andreen, uh, the CEO of um, IndieFlix.com. And um, so we had to pitch your project. So I'm glad that you said that the story has to be there because the next question was going to be, you know, what, um, how much of the selling of a screenplay is in the story and how much of it is in the pitch? Or is it equal? Um, uh, say that again. So, uh, so how much of um, selling, you know, like when you're pitching a project, how much of it is the story, you know, being strong and how much of it is actually the way you pitch it and how you pitch it? Well, there's two different worlds. One is the, the TV streaming world, which is very pitch oriented. You know, it's all about you walking into a room with this idea and selling them the dream of the idea and the characters and the interaction of the characters and the concept of the, of the show. And you're selling them the dream in, in a certain, of which, and, and, and out of that pitch, hopefully they'll buy and then they'll order the script, right? Um, features are a little different. I think the, the pitch world for features is not what it was when I first started, which was you used to be able to just go pitch, you know, a hundred million dollar projects, which is not, doesn't and Greg and can someone else can speak to this better than I can. It's really not the world that exists as much anymore, but it does exist in TV. Um, and you know, in in reality, w when you pitch TV, you really are pitching character arcs and the characters' interactions with each other and the universe that they're living in. How interesting is the world? How interesting are these characters in in relation to each other? And how how does their conflicts and does, does their interactions further the story. One thing that I'm even learning more and more is how, as, as how intensely you have to focus on the wholeness of the characters and to flush that out. And also to know your story, to be very, to be very intimate with where it's going, where it's gonna end, it's, you know, because a lot of writers will often, they'll have an idea for a pilot and they'll go in and they will have a, a real sense of where it's the, the it's going down the down the runway, which mm -hmm. is what they also want to know. They want to know what it's going to look like in season two and three. Um, so uh, I don't know if that quite answers the question, but yeah, it, I think it does. And it um, you know, I want to bring Christopher into this because you know what, what you do. I mean, as many scripts as you've read, and you know what, what you do with the inside pitch. Yeah, you know, what are the deal breakers in pitches, Christopher? In your mind, you know, what are what are the deal breakers when? You know, if a pitch goes wrong, what are some of the things that usually fall through the crack? Well, I think that Josh summed it up very well, which is that I need to be able to see the project, right? Like I need to be able to see the movie. I need to be able to see the TV series. And uh, I think that's probably where a lot of pitches go wrong is that the pitch is not able to allow me to envision what this project would look like. Uh, and, uh, and look, it, it takes some real skill to be able to convey all of that. I mean, just that list that Josh just went down of yep. things, you know, of those bullet points that have to be hit. Um, it's tough. So, um, so for me, I'll often kind of walk away and go, yeah, I don't like, like, I don't see it. I don't get it. I don't see it. Jo and Jonathan, can you hear us? Oh, I think he's frozen again. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, Christopher, what, what Christopher was he saying. He is no good, by the way. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> he can hear us. He just can't respond or defend himself right now. <laughs> and, and, and what Christopher was saying is, 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 is also true, especially with buyers, because buyers, and in, in, in my experience, 
studio executives are really thought to think defensively. They're really thought to poke a hole in an idea. You know, I've always said, and when I sold my, I've sold a few shows when I sold the one, you know, I've always said, you're walking into a room, you're taking 10 minutes, you're telling them a thought you had, and you're wanting them to give you $70 million to produce a series. That's what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, that's all this is. It's about, I have an idea. They work at a, you know, I got five guys. They work at a guitar center. You know, there's a rock guy. There's an emo guy. There's a country guy. And you talk about the world. And then you just want to walk out of there with them just handing you $70 million to go produce this and go right to series, which is hard. I mean, they're, th they're, they're trained to really do exactly what Christopher said. They have to see it. They have to see the billboard. They have to see not only what it's gonna mean for them, but what, what kind of roles are these? What's the depth of the roles? Will the talent respond to it? And all of those issues. So I think it's, I think it's in, in important to be your own producer as a writer, because if you're your own producer, the, you know, I've often talked to writers who can't imagine what the billboard is. I said, well then, you know, if you can't imagine what the, what, what the you know, you gotta think about how it's gonna be sold as well because they're thinking about that. Um, and there are certain ideas that, like I have a friend of mine who has a great idea, which is kind of like a stranger things, but it's set in, in, in camps, a horror type take on things. And he wrote a spec. And the spec itself, I think is not great, it's okay. But what's interesting is the idea and the concept for the anthology series is brilliant to me because it's about camp and it's about, it, it could be a different camp every, you know, it's everybody's experience and the way that thematically it mirrors fear and our first time away from home and all of those things. But I said to him, I said, there's always a bad version of every idea, of every idea, the executive is listening to it and thinking, I love that, but if it goes bad, it's gonna suck. But you know what I'm saying? And often when you write a spec, when it's written, it very much can illuminate what they thought the speed bumps were. But when you pitch it and you pitch the dream of it and pitch what it could be, then very often they're buying the con into the concept. And then when they buy it and then you are hired to write it, even though you might have already written a spec, by the way, on a, on a pilot in the pilot, then at least you're, you're developing it with them. You're getting their thoughts. You're hearing their concerns. You're, you know, you're getting their notes and so on. I think in many ways you do have to be your own producer when you're when you're pitching and and thinking about the ideas that you pitch. Mm -hmm. And I do also suggest that you talk to people. Writers tend to be very insular, and they tend to like to like get into their room and write something. And I'm and the one thing I learned a long time ago: talk to people that you know or that are in the business, and just ask about the, these, these ideas and, and, and get input so that you are not sort of stuck in your, the own, your own sort of writer bubble and then get surprised five months later when some very obvious questions are asked about it. And that, yep. that's a good point. Uh, and I think this is, uh, Chris, in a 2018 interview, I read you made the comment that you don't look for good writing, you look for good movies. And can you elaborate based on what Josh said? Just it sounds like that's in line with what, what Josh was just saying. Anything to add to? Yeah, I, you know, I don't keep a running tally of uh, my quotes, but uh, <laughs> I might have been misquoted there. I think I probably <laughs> said something like, uh, I don't look for good writers. Uh, I look for movies, because ultimately that's not my job. You know, my job isn't to sign writers. Uh, my job is to find a movie. Uh, other people, like a manager, for example, they are looking for writers. Um, I'm not even looking for screenplays. You know, I'm looking for movies. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference because I read a lot of screenplays and I'll go, okay, yeah, but this isn't a movie. Mm -hmm. And um, so, that really does sort of fold into what it is that Josh just said, which is that uh, it, it, it really is about me having to walk away, uh, understanding what the movie is because, it, because I have to be able to communicate that to other people. Mm -hmm. So if you weren't able to communicate it to me, how can I then in turn communicate it to my coworker or to a client? I, I can't do it. So it just, it dies there. It dies there with me. You know, that doesn't mean that the writer's not going to go on and pitch it somewhere else and have great success. Uh, I've passed on lots of scripts that have gone on to great success. 
uh, but that script didn't meet the requirements that I was looking for at that particular time. Can you give any detail on some of the requirements that might be helpful? Um, well, you know, I, I said they kind of vary, I think, based on perhaps what a, a certain client is looking for at any particular time, uh, but also just the general things, you know, it's like because I'm looking for movies for actors, I'm looking for roles, you know, so I'm looking for a protagonist that's responsible for pushing the story forward. He's got all the great beats, he's got an arc, you know, all of that textbook 101 stuff. Uh, because one of the first questions that Denzel will always ask, anytime I'm like, listen, I've got a great script. First question is, you know, what does the character do? How does the character change? Because that's interesting to the actor. That's, that's what he wants to know right away. Uh, and if I don't have a good answer for that, pass. Even if I like the script, it's a pass. Great advice. And so that's something you look for in the pitches that you would review. Big time for him and for other actors, I would say. Absolutely. But also just generally speaking for any story, you know, it's, it's, I guess I sort of subscribe to, you know, kind of the Aristotelian uh, methodology of writing. And, and, and so, yeah, you know, I really feel like a story is propelled by the character and the character needs to be on a journey. He needs to have a goal because in pursuit of that goal is the way you determine who the character is because the choices that that character makes in trying to achieve that goal is how he is defined. Uh, and so when I hear a pitch and the character's not doing anything or he's more reactive, it, it just, I'm not saying that it can't work, but my experience has been that more often than not, it doesn't work. You just get a second act that meanders and, uh, and it's boring and there's no rising action. And so I'm just like, yeah, you know, like I like the idea, but I don't like the character, how he interacts with this concept. He's not activated in a way that's particularly interested or he's not activated at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's great in a pitch also is if the writer sort of adapts very quickly, right? So he's got to sort of bounce around and play patty cake with the executive. So if the executive is like, well, you know, I, that doesn't seem like that's the best choice. What if the character did something like this? And then now maybe, if it's not a completely off the wall, ridiculous idea, you can start to play with that. Then all of a sudden the executive becomes a little more invested in the project. And as much as you can reel in the executive and, and, and have him or her become invested in the story, then you have a better chance. You know, that's interesting. And sorry to interrupt Genevieve, but, um, you know, Josh never was job swing boat. You had heavy hitting actors and, you know, producers and the like. In development or pre-production, um, were there different viewpoints on how they thought the story should have been told or how things played out? And how did you handle that in collaboration? Oh yeah, well, I mean, the whole thing is a collaboration. I mean, you know, from the beginning to the end and different people deal with it in different ways. And those are all very different scenarios as was my TV show. And, you know, you, you uh, adapt by, by listening and by, you know, it's, 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 it's important to, to realize that, that everything is subjective um, and that you, who are best to listen to other ideas because in the moment when you are in that moment, you're not always going to come to the best conclusion. And what Christopher was saying about, about you know, sort of adapting even in a pitch situation is, an, is, 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 is very true. So if, like, if I'm direct, if I'm, if I'm like directing and somebody says it would be great if the character did this or Nolte, you know, was a little softer or, you know, Costner was doing, you know, wasn't quite as remote in this, you know, and, and, you know, I'll go do another take and, 
you know, there's a lot of input that I take, but in the writing realm, um, I think you are best to, to imagine and to think new if an idea is brought to you because, you know, human complex, it's, you know, there's such levels to human complexity. And, you know, the arc of the character, where he begins and where he ends, is the most important. There is no secondary story plot device that's as important as that one thought. And the world, you know, very often an executive will fall in love with the world that you pitch because sometimes the concept is just, let's say, they can envision is great. They could, oh, I could see that movie. But then they really want to make sure that there's a there's a character in there. And very often, you know, when a movie goes doesn't doesn't quite work, it, it is because you could see the struggle between trying to find how invested we are with the character. And the other thing is this: that the second you are invested and you're on this character's journey, and the use the word Christopher used was activate, which is very important because you you know your character to me at least in my opinion, has to always be pushing the story forward. He has to be wanting something. What does he want? In every scene, there needs to be some sense of what it is, what's the verb of, what's the need of that scene. But in, in general, if your audience is bought into the character and they're on the ride with them at the beginning, it has to happen pretty quickly, then then really the movie could do anything. It could be as crazy and fantastical, or it can be as far-fetched in some regards as, as one would imagine, or one would think as long as you buy into what their story is and, and invest it in where they're going, like what's going to happen to them. And uh, so I think that is a cornerstone of a, of, of a good pitch and a, and a script. Yeah, we uh, we ran into that last week with uh, several of the pitchers where um, uh, Sheila kept asking basically everyone, how does it end? Because she just, she knew how it began. She needed to know how it ended, you know? So that was some, you know, as you're repeating, valuable feedback that she gave also. Well, you know, most pitches that uh, I hear, especially from new writers. So I know that there are a lot of new writers that are uh, watching this right now. Uh, I'd say probably 80% of pitches that I hear from new writers, like on the inside pitch, my Facebook group, uh, the character doesn't want anything. There's no goal. The character has nothing to do. So they have a concept, but then the character doesn't do anything. So it's it's liar liar. They have a con with a concept where the character is a patho a pathological liar who has to tell the truth for 24 hours. That's a concept, but until you give the character something to do, you don't have a movie. So in the case of liar liar, now this pathological liar who is an attorney, uh, he has to uh, win what really amounts to the biggest case of his career while absent of his toolbox, his lies. But it's not a movie until you give the character something to do. It's just prior to giving Jim Carrey the goal to win this case, you just have a Saturday Night Live sketch. It's just a pathological liar has to tell the truth for 24 hours. So it really is about giving the character something to do. And so often uh, I don't hear that, which is why I'll never even ask or very, very rarely in a pitch will I ask what's the ending because I can't even get through the beginning of a pitch. Do you, where, what advice do you have there? Do you, is it an outline issue? Do writers not outline the story properly? Do they do they need to bring in actors earlier? Because as an actor myself, I always get the script script after it's gone through a you know a few rounds of revision, and I think I always think I can be a lot more useful, you know, sometimes early on. So what? How do you both remedy those situations? If you you know, Chris, if you're working with them. Um, you know, writer who's, who's stuck on something and, and Joshua, if you're, you know, potentially stuck on a script or having an issue somewhere in the development process, how do you, how do you deal with it? Um, if I'm stuck with the, the, the idea of, if I can't find a, a way forward. Uh, with right. That. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, I, what Christopher's saying with Liar Liar is a really interesting example. I also sometimes think of Groundhog Day, which is a great concept, right? But, it, you know, until you find that, realize that it's actually a romance, right? Like that, you know, you have to give it that sense of what is it that the Bill Murray character is needing and wanting and what kind of man is he at the beginning and yep. what kind of man does he end up being through this love affair? Um, so that though it's a high concept, it's sort of the high concepts, the architecture. Um, with, and I think people get very enamored with their concepts and they don't listen to the sort of the, 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 the simple things um, of the whys and the, you know, what it is. You know, as far as trying to overcome stumbling blocks, it's, it's a, a continual sort of exercise in trying to see what it is the character wants, where he came from, but what it is that in the present, not just in the past, but in the very moment going forward are the things that are stopping him from getting what he needs and what he wants. What are the things that are going to be the impediments for him to realize what his ultimate goal is? Establishing an interesting character who's a fish out of water, for example, is good. But you have to get a sense and the people have to be able to imagine what it is that is going to take them on this journey. What's the twist going to be? What are the unforeseen things that are going to occur to him that are going to make his particular journey interesting? Because ultimately, human experience is pretty limited. We all have a, a few basic things we, have, we go through in life. We fall in love. We go to work. There are some tragedies that occur to us. There's some... In the, in many cases, violence that occurs. It's just how are we telling that same story over and over? And what are these new obstacles that are gonna make this particular telling of that story interesting or more interesting than other tellings of this story? Um, because they, you know, in, it's a very interesting balance. And the dance you're doing is that you want the executive to be able to imagine this because it's feels a little bit like something that has been successful. I'm always asked for what a comp is. What is a tonal comp? What show is it like? You know, and you always want to say, it's not like anything that's ever been, right? But, <laughs> you know, but it has. But so, at the, yeah. so on some level, it's just this dance between something that we, are, we recognize, but told in a way that's just interesting and new enough that makes us feel, I really want to, to, to see this and, and to, and to, and to go along on, on the journey. Yeah, great. Chris, what do you think? Uh, you know, I think that writers shouldn't be afraid to talk to people sometimes and, and uh, because it's a good way to sort of clear the head and maybe work out some of these kinks that they might be experiencing. Just sort of as an aside, there was a, uh, I did a Zoom class yesterday. I was a guest for UC Riverside in a screenwriting class. So they were students. So one student pitched an idea about this small town that's being ravaged by a deadly pandemic. And there's a serial killer that is killing the sick people. And so I just said to her, well, why is the serial killer killing sick people? Why doesn't he just wait for the disease to kill them? And she said, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> and it's a pretty obvious, it's a pretty obvious question. And, uh, but sometimes you just need to talk to people. So yeah, yeah, that's very. That as I was saying before, it's so important to get feedback. You know, um, talking about pitches, I was I was hiring a writer, and they had done a, a script, and I I heard the concept, and I just went, I just isn't this is how did this not get made? And it was a, it was a zombie show. Uh, it was a zombie show, and the zombie show was about small town, and there was a girl in the small town, and she was kind of seen as the loose girl and no one really liked her but you know all the other girls didn't like her but the guys kind of liked her and then it, it follows her story and then their zombie apocalypse happens and it turns out that this girl for some reason was the one person on earth whose blood had the anecdote so she didn't turn into a zombie and the only other people that she didn't turn into the zombie are the boys that she'd slept with right so it was her and every kid in high school she slept with are the only ones around that survived the zombie apocalypse right and and I read the script, I thought it was great. And then, but it was funny, she had no sense of where it was gonna go. Like there was no bigger concept to it, you know? Christopher talked about the um, sketch thing, you know? One thing that's interesting about so many great movies with great concepts that if you actually just boiled it down, it's just a really great Saturday Night Live, live sketch. You know, like, like in, in some regard, 
it's really taking the time to think it through. And, you know, bouncing it off friends is so important. And it's a step that so many writers, because people have not, as a writer, being a writer, there's a natural anxiety and self-consciousness about your idea, a fear that your idea is going to be judged and then instantly sort of put aside. And you've spent three months thinking that's the greatest idea in the world. And you're afraid that if you go to this person, you go to Chris or you go to somebody, they're going to say to you, ah, the idea. And, you know, opposed to, you know, and so that, that can paralyze a writer and send them into their room to write a script for a year and then come out. And someone like Chris was, I love this. If you would have spoken to me nine, 10 months ago, I'd say, well, I love this, but to, you know, she should live here, not there, because it's, living in a farm is different than living in a city, and a city so much more, or, or, is so much better for this character. Like simple things. So I really do encourage getting people's ideas, um, it, and then taking what you like and what you don't. But I guarantee you, there will be. It will help. It will help. Well, you know, it, it's great that you bring that up, Josh, because you know, you look at the movie Jobs that you did about Steve Jobs. Yeah. You have your writing about storyline, and then you have factual events yeah. that happen that you had to consider both. So, I mean, was there a lot of input from people on, you know, how the story should flow compared to the factual events? Or well, I think I think a biopic is really um, is really really hard. Um, I think anything biographical is difficult for anyone to do. Um, I even think that the Aaron Sorkin, I was in the thing with him. I mean, it, it, you struggle with it, which is why I think some of the greatest um, biography uh, biopics are of criminals and of nefarious people because the natural element of their lives is so colorful and the plots alone are so dynamic and their personalities are so huge. But when you're dealing with ordinary people, you're kind of moored by the facts. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you, they're stubborn things, but you can't get around them. And what you try to do is you try to fill in the sinew, the things, how do they get to this moment? You try to imagine a conversation. There's some great, by the way, biopics. So I'm not denouncing them. I'm just saying they're hard. Like when I, if I find like, oh, I'm doing graves, I'm, I'm doing a writer's room. There's a thousand ideas for every story point. There's, yeah. there's too many actually, you can get way off, you know, you can get way out, way out to, to, to see on some ideas, but a biopic really, you know, pushes you into a corner for many reasons. One is legal, you know, two is, you know, I mean, you can only deal with a certain amount of facts and the best ones in my opinion are the ones who get really creative and are able to get, you know, like Vice was really great or something as old as all that jazz about Bob Fosse, you know, if you can get kind of weirdly um, magic realism -y with it and you can go crazy, but the straight telling, which is what I was sort of tasked to do, which is really, really hard and, 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 and it suffered from it, I think, uh, on certain levels, is harder to do in my opinion. Uh, but, I, you know, I do think there's something always intriguing about somebody who is real and actors love it too. I mean, actors love the real the guy who really lived and on this thing that I was going to do after exile with De Niro was based on a real story. And he wanted to, he wanted to know what he looked like and tape on him. He wanted people who were about this guy's age in the area of Philadelphia who talked like him to hear tapes of him. So to be honest, it's a huge draw for actors and in series to do. But when you write one to try to get, to try to tell it in, you know, 117 pages is, is tough. It's tough. Um, but uh, so the it, beginning writer should stay away from biopics unless. Well, really I, I think <laughs> uh, not necessarily. If you have the rights to, if you have the rights to somebody who is just in, you know, the, the Andy Warhol estate yeah. says you must write the one, and you know. <laughs> but even then, you're going to be well. He wasn't that interesting. Like, like, there's so much to writing a real person. Um, not the least of which, like I said, the bigger personalities, the, the, the more amplified people in history are so much easier because the more normal you are, the, the more it's just, well, he's just another guy who did something great. But other than that great thing, he's just a normal guy. And how do yeah. you make that? And it goes against all writer instinct. Talk about, you know, sometimes there weren't that many obstacles. You want them to be, but they're not as many as you think. Steve Jobs, for example, he just was 19 met was you know who had a great idea for this person you know he was a great you know pr guy you know publisher guy with jobs he wasn't really a computer guy and his life was pretty like wow young i mean like it, like it wasn't this it wasn't like al capone so um 
Yeah. You know um, what I would suggest uh, oh, is looking for the interesting story. Instead of presenting a birth to earth, womb to tomb kind of biopic from you know, birth to death, finding that interesting moment within that person's life. Yeah. Some of uh, Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, I think are kind of the kings at writing these sort of straightforward biopics. They did The People versus Larry Flint. They did Ed Wood. They did Dolmite is my name. Uh, and they're, they're just, you know, they're really, really solid. But they understand it's about, yeah, like Ed Wood might have an amazingly fascinating life. Like we could make a movie about him wearing women's underwear in World War II. But instead, I want to tell the story about him making the worst film of all time. And, and so, because that's the hook, right? So it's like, I could go into a, I could go into a pitch meeting and say, yeah, so I want to do a biopic on, on Ed Wood. And people are like, well, who's he? Well, he was a really bad filmmaker. Well, that's not interesting because there's a lot of bad filmmakers. But I want to do a biopic on, on Ed Wood. He was a bad filmmaker, so bad that he made the worst movie of all time. And my screenplay is going to tell that story. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I, that I, whole I, life, you know, you've taken that whole life and you've shrunk it into something that is digestible and pitchable rather than trying to tell, you know, like the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I agree with that. In fact, it's funny on the jobs. And I think that, you know, I think in the Sorkin version as well, he, 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 he followed that. He tried to find that one moment. And in my version, I didn't write my version, which is one thing I hadn't written. It was sort of brought to me just as it was a, it was a gig for hire. But I, I remember thinking that exact thing. And I remember reading about his life and I did so much research. And then I came to this point of his life, which was when he left Apple, when he first got diagnosed with cancer, Steve Jobs said, I'm not going to be treated. I'm going to be, because he had a whole philosophy on all of this. He wanted to go on a fruit diet and, you know, and they thought he was nuts and he was really irresponsible. He had tiny children. The doctor at the time said he had about a 60% chance survival rate the day he was diagnosed. But what he did is he disappeared into his house and he slowly started deteriorating. Um, and then six or seven months later, he came out emaciated and he had about a month to live and he, you know, because of, he, he, he refused treatment at the beginning. But I thought to myself, it's like the madness of King George, the stories of him as an old, as, as, as a man stuck in his house, reliving his life, just moments of his life, but the story of who he was at the end was so interesting to me. That's where there was so, and yet if I, I always wished I could have done that or the other version could have just focused on what it was like to have to, to be the, to be to have taken that slice. So, but Christopher, it's, it's very true. You, you you look for the moment if you can find the moment that amplifies and represents the person, but also is the most dramatically interesting. Um, which it, and then focus on that and give it you know give it a, a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, because too many biopics I read just don't. And by the way, it is it is just. It is biopic. It's not biopic. I hate when I, I hate when, <laughs> like when any, when anybody says, yeah, I have a biopic. I, I'm like, just, I'm immediately turned off. Yeah, it's a medical uh, term, isn't it? Biopic? Yeah, I don't know what it is, but I'm just like, come on, really? <laughs> anyway. Um, biopic, biopic. Um, uh, I don't we, know what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> we, well, it's a good point for if you both have a few minutes to stick around for a few questions sure. from the audience. Okay, great. So our our tech uh, tech producer Todd, do you do we have questions from the audience that you can uh, share and we'll get some answered? Okay, so how how Todd, with the voice of God? Yeah, Todd, the voice of God. How how important is it to register your script with WGA or U.S. copyright? It is not important to register your script uh, to register your script with the WGA. It is important to register your script with the United States Copyright. That is important. The WGA is merely a um, uh, a time stamp. It's not. It's not going to hold up. It's it, if you're if look, your script is automatically copyrighted the minute that you're done. 
in the United States. So in theory, you don't actually have to get a paper copyright. But the reason that you do get a paper copyright is because it then uh, allows you to sue for additional things that you would not be able to sue for uh, if you didn't have a paper copyright. So it's not like it's a big deal. So just get a paper copyright. And in regards to the uh, WJ registration, that's just a lot of bullshit. Save your Oh, I'm sorry. I think my no, mother's no, watching. Okay. Sorry, mom. Yeah, but you know what? I, I I agree with that. One little trick that I do as a writer, and I also as a writer have been sued on Swing Vote. I got sued. Um, so what what it's it, what's important? What what I do weirdly is I just email every draft to myself because that's time stamped, and sometimes it's just as easy, and I think as it holds up just as well. Every you know you know one thing that's good to do is to save your drafts. Um, when you start getting out there and talking to people and getting input and people will want to start take owner take ownership over your things that you've done um so the more of evidence that you have of what you have existed all, all along the the way for yourself is good um because if for your own uh, peace of mind but you, I, I don't think a wj registration is 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 necessary but, but email them to yourself, like just attach it and email it. So there'll just be a timestamp on, look, I, this is, this is what this draft was from July. I don't know what they're talking about. If somebody tries to question it, for example. Good advice. Anything spec writers should consider what's better. Uh, let's, let's, let's into this first. A anything spec writers should consider. And then it says, I guess this is, um, for example, what's better or worse emerging passe global event biopic biopic bio, bio I mean biopic sorry I was thinking my <laughs> biopic uh, based on on a book with rights they just give uh, different examples uh, I don't really think that there's an answer to that per se I think that ultimately uh, first and foremost you have to write what you're passionate about I wouldn't try to chase trends or chase the market per se, because you'll always be way behind. And um, uh, yeah, like I know a lot of people are like, yeah, everything right now is all about IP. And so, you know, I have a novel and uh, I'm going to adapt that. And that's great, you know, if the novel is like Gone with the Wind, but if nobody's ever heard of the novel, if it sold one copy, uh, then that's not really the kind of IP that's going to excite anybody. So you also have to use a little bit of common sense in regards to that. Um, I, I, I just say, look at the movies that people go to see and, and, and you know, that's always a good place to start. Uh, I, there are certain things that I could say, like period pieces are certainly more difficult to sell on spec, but actually that tide is turning a little bit because now we've got places like Amazon and Netflix, and they don't seem to subscribe to those same kinds of parameters that the studios do. So just write what you want to write. And if it's good, then people are going to take notice. That, that's valuable advice. And um, another question that came in that I think is related is how, what's the best advice for writers outside of LA to get their work read and made? You know, I know here in New Mexico, Albuquerque in particular, Netflix bought Albuquerque Studios. So the entire state is like, oh my God, I have to get my project to Netflix. And they're banging down the doors of the studios here. And they're like, hey, you have to go through the same channels that were in place before out in California. So what, what advice would you have for writers to get their work read and made? Whether it's uh, with Netflix or anything. Um, I, I think it's, First of all, it's a weird, we're in a weird place. It's not just the COVID, but it's also the WGA thing with the, with the agents. And, uh, but I will say, fortunately or unfortunately, and in my experience, and I could be wrong, I think being represented is still, as your city, is still the best way. And, you know, there are resources through the WGA to post things, um, but, being represented by an agent, I, I don't, I almost don't know of any other way when you're talking about a real submission to Netflix or a real submission to any studio. I think you're going to have to have a uh, representation and the way you get representation is to make that script as good as you can get it. 
and then understand that it is an industry that has its own standards. And on a certain level, there is a certain, you know, level of um, uh, uh, vetting that goes through every script. And one of the hardest things I can tell you as a writer is to believe that what you've written is so good, you know? And I know that because I'm a writer and I feel that sometimes how I feel. But you're also entering an industry that does have its own hierarchy, its own sense of people who've been doing it and have studying at it. So it's no different than wanting to go to a bank and say, oh, well, I want to become a banker tomorrow. I, have, I don't have a degree in it. Now, it doesn't mean you have to have a degree. It's to understand that it may take you a little longer to get to that level in the bank. But there is a bit of a myth with screenwriters that you'll just press send and someone will see it. And I love this. I'm going to send it right to MGM. You know, you got you to gotta find an agent. You've got to keep going, keep going and listen to feedback. You know, the greatest thing you could do, and I'm sorry to take the time on this, but if you That's could okay. ever get coverage of your script, and I know there's places that do it professionally, and some of them are good, I don't know about others, but if you could ever get, even if you get rejected, if you could just ask for the coverage from the agents and listen to what they said, because I'll tell you, those people who do the covering, those young people who come in and really cover a, a script, often I just think have brilliant thoughts. Not brilliant, but they're, they're, they're trained to tell you story, character, commercial, you know, listen to that and then rewrite maybe, you know, so the, I don't know. I don't know if Christopher has a thought there. No, well, yeah, look, I mean, that's a, that is a great place to get feedback because it's not coming from anybody you know. And the reader uh, has a job to do. And so it is going to be a completely unbiased opinion. Uh, and that's probably the best that you can ever get. Because even when your best friend reads your script and tells it to you straight, right. He's not telling it to you all that straight. He's going to give it to you straight, but with a little bit of a cushion, but not in that particular kind of example. Even the paid services, that's also the problem with these paid services, yeah. is that you are a client. And so they're not going to just come right out and say, this script sucks, uh, where in perhaps a studio coverage or an agency coverage, they might pretty much say that. Um, and I don't remember what the question was, but I'm sure it was brilliant. It was uh, what, the, the best advice outside of LA to get their work read and made. Oh, the other thing I'm going to say, one other little thing, you know, when you're done with the script that you just wrote, you know, you're, you're just out of, whenever you're starting, write your next one. That it's going to take, it could take seven or eight. This idea that you write a script and you hold on to the script and then you just go about your life for a decade and try and hope that it, 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 it comes true. If you want to be a writer, you, you just do it. You just keep, keep writing and listening and go right to your next idea. Keep, keep thinking and producing, you know, I mean, if, if it's your passion. You should be writing probably two to three scripts a year if it's yeah. all possible as you're trying to break in. Yeah. You really should. And, and, um, and again, I think being open to feedback on your script. And uh, I know writers from 20 years ago and they're still peddling the same script that they wrote 20 years ago. And of course that's a problem. Um, and, uh, but being outside of LA, look, you know, so much of this business is about who you know. It really is about relationships. Yep. But we live in an era now where you can make relationships here. Um, for, for example, my Facebook group, people make relationships there from all around the world. I'm on there every day. I work at the world's largest talent agency and I'm talking to writers from Timbuktu. So there are ways to connect. You can follow people on Twitter. Uh, there are events like this online that you can get into, ask questions. Uh, there's a lot more opportunities now than there were for writers 30 years ago who came to LA or who were living outside of LA and more now uh, for writers who come to LA. I noticed that the next question was about screenwriting contests and there are a lot of screenwriting contests now. And um, you don't have to live in LA to win a screenwriting contest. Now I would say that most screenwriting contests are probably not gonna do very much for your career but there is the Nickel Fellowship. And whether I believe in screenwriting contests or not, it doesn't matter. 
what matters is, is that the industry falls for the brand of these things. So if your script is one of the top five winning nickel scripts, your script is going to be read by everybody in town. Uh, and you could very well end up being signed by a manager. And uh, so that's a way to get in. Now, I think this year, the Nickel Fellowship had 7,800 entries and there's only five winners. But you figure if you're one of those five, your script has floated through the flotsam. It still may not be the best. I've read a lot of Nickel winning scripts that I thought sucked. But um, still, it doesn't matter because the industry knows that you've been branded as a nickel winner and that's something they can sell. That's something that they want. So using screenwriting contests, certain ones, do your research on the contests that are effective. Um, use those. I, I have a quick question for the both of you. Um, when is the right time for a writer to you know, let's say it's moving forward to go to production and it's greenlit. When's the time that the writer has to let go of that project and let the producers and directors take over and make this film? You mean when he's booted off? Uh, what'd you when say? Booted, when he's booted off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and he's no longer on the, he's no longer on the email chain. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. like, what happened? Was, <laughs> I, I have had, you know, people come to me with their script and, hey, I need you to help me produce this, but, I need to be a producer on it too. And, you know, I need to work right next to the director and right away I say, no, I'm not touching this. Well, look, being a writer is an ascending pyramid of anxiety. You're sitting in your apartment in Hollywood. You can't imagine anyone's ever going to really buy this because you can't imagine that's going to be, and then someone buys it. Then you, then, then, oh my God, someone's bought it. And now they have their notes. And now you got to do all the notes. And then you get worried about the notes and then they're going to cast it. Oh God, you can't cast this person. And they, and they cast that person. And then they make it and they're going to get this director. And then they're going to, then, you know, then, they're, then you've got it and you think, oh, my anxieties are over. It's sold. Disney's doing it. But then you walk into a marketing meeting and you hate the poster. Like, I mean, you know, there's never a moment, I think, for especially the way the writer, writer like I remember with uh, Swing Vote, I, um, on that one, it was Disney and I walked in and it was like, I was a great, you know, they had a poster of, of, of Costner, like looking back with this, and it looked like it was Tin Cup. And I realized you're going to sell Tin Cup. And, it, and I thought, you know, you got to let go. Uh, pretty quickly in the process, I think, um, for your own sanity. Uh, and I think that's, there's a moment when that script, if you have a good relate, this, this is what I would say, stay very open with the relationship you have with the director and the producers, be collaborative all the way, understand and notice to try to make it better, not to try to hurt it. Um, if someone does not pick up on what you think is on the page, it's because it's not there to try to lobby and fight for the thought that to try to, to try to convince them they didn't, they saw it wrong or, Oh, go back on page seven. There's the line that says what your answer is your question. No, you got to listen to their notes, take their notes, be a partner, be a partner on the set, be a partner. So what if, if, if an actor needs another take on a line, they can trust you and you become that kind of writer and you'll be an asset and get out of your own way and realize you just want to make it as best as you can with whatever and whoever is playing it or whoever is directing it. Yep. As my old boss used to say, pitch, pitch and detach. It's hard for people that do. People you have so much invested in something. And I do want to plug, since we unfortunately couldn't have Jonathan join us, he does run the, he's a co-founder of the Bigfoot Green Room, and he has a year-long writers program. It's geared toward Pacific Northwest writers, but maybe there's something else that could start up in the Southwest or something, you know, on a larger scale, since we'll be doing Zoom for the foreseeable future. So I want to give that plug in the, the other thing I'm going to say, yeah. is, you know, one, one thing I'll say about that as well is that, you know, when it comes to things like you have to have a, some, some thick skin, you know, rejection should just be your fuel to the next one. When Christopher said that he pitched Denzel Washington a script, imagine that you wrote a script, it gets to WME, the, the covering agent liked it enough to send it up the chain. And finally, Christopher takes the time to read it. He likes it enough, which is, probably I would say 2% of what he reads. And when it, comes, when it comes to the Denzels of the world or the Matt Damons and the Wahlbergs of the world, it's probably 0.5% of what he reads. 
he gets on a phone call with the actor who does, who knows this much about it except the, the broad strokes. He goes, ah, by the way, there's no control over the client that passes. Christopher says, oh, did the best. Now you're the writer at the bottom of the chain. So you have to understand that people are, if you do, if you write something good, there will be people who will champion do the very best they can for it. And you gotta, you gotta just keep, just keep your spirits up and rejections are really not personal. I mean, they just are not. There's so many things that have to go right because you've said a few things. You've said, what does it take to get it bought? And what does it take to get made? In a weird way, it's a lot, I know a lot of writers who have had a huge career either in TV or selling specs that have never been made. And, and but there are those, but to get it actually made, a lot has to go right. Um, and just trust that and don't get bitter. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and again, don't take it personally because people do pass on projects that that they love or that they think are amazing. Happens all the time. Uh, you know, perhaps there's a, a production schedule, a client reads a script and loves it, but he's booked out two and a half years. You know, the studio or the producers don't want to wait that long. So, you know, he, he has to pass. Uh, might pass because the movie's being shot out of the country and she doesn't want to leave the country for whatever reason. Especially it's, during these times, you well, know? Well, especially during these times, yes. Yeah. So quick question for you, Christopher. Um, I know Nick Cage. Um, did he come to you about the Tiger King or was it just like, hey, I'm taking this to Nick Cage? I'm just curious. Well, you know, the, there was, uh, I can't go into the details. Yeah, of understood. <laughs> Of it, but all I'll say is that there were um, rumors going around that um, Rob Lowe was going to play the part. And uh, I don't know, don't you think Nick Cage is a much better choice? When I, I so I saw the first episode God. of Tiger King, I thought that was Nick Cage on screen. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> no, Nick Cage is amazing. And he's a new client, isn't he, for you? I mean, he's, he's fairly new. Yeah, I think he's yeah, been he, around a year or so. He's uh, he's going to be great. Well, I love, you know, uh, Nick, Nick Cage. I, and he's a very rare actor. I mean, he's an actor who could do, he could pretty much, he does everything. But he still could, win, I could still see him winning an Oscar one day. Or, you know, or uh, like there's no, he's so individually and uniquely weirdly talented and boy this is a great role for him i i just can't you know it's gonna be great he's yeah, a his, bio, biopic guy his yeah. creative I biopic stuck always, in my head i can't get it out yeah. but the script still has to be written so you know that's yeah. it's a long way out yeah it is a way out yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's um, any final thoughts, guys, because um, I just want to introduce what's happening next week. And speaking of Nick Cage and, you know, kind of the weird creative genius that he is, we're uh, next week is the 10th anniversary of Dennis Hopper's passing. Josh, I know you don't know Dennis well from Swing Vote. And um, so we're going to have uh, his uh, personal assistant, Satya De La Manito, on, who's his personal assistant for 40 years. I was his assistant here in uh, New Mexico for several years. Um, we also have Nick Ebling, who did the uh, documentary called Along for the Ride that came out two years ago about Dennis. It was a really phenomenal documentary. If you haven't seen it, I think it's on Amazon Prime. Um, but yeah, are there any final thoughts on this episode um, before we start getting into uh, next week's episode and introducing what's going to happen? Josh, any final um, thoughts? I, I, when I first met uh, Dennis, oh, you want me to, oh, you want me to just talk about the business or Dennis? Well, you, can, you can mention Dennis too, I mean, if you want. And then let's talk about your thoughts about how things are going to move forward, you know, over the next few weeks. Oh, in, during COVID, you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the way, I think everybody who's a writer should keep, this is the time to write because there's going to be a moment when this is over and maybe sooner than later, and they're going to want content. I mean, there's no question that this is a content hungry industry. Uh, and you should be taking advantage of this tragedy by simply having that excuse, which is never going to come along again to be in your house and write and, um, and be positive and as far as the parameters of what you write, I'm not necessarily sure that, that should be, you should be too affected by it. Is this the time to write the story about, you know, the, um, the, the British invasion somewhere of something? Maybe not, but at the same time, you shouldn't hold any sort of um, 
restriction on on your creativity. Just just write and and use this time wisely. And quick thoughts on Dennis Hopper as we're gonna. When I first met Dennis Hopper, I went to see him for swing vote. I flew up to Las Vegas and I went to the Hard Rock and I went to the pool and there was a tent and it was 120 degrees and Dennis was in a tent and he was wearing just as he had gone golfing that day and he was wearing a suit. He looked, the great thing about Dennis is he was Hollywood. He was classic Hollywood. He was a legend and he, you could feel it in him, but he was a very sweet, very genuine man. Um, he really cared uh, and he never kind of quite lost that free spirit about him. I know he was taking a motorcycle ride across the country at that age even. I remember he was, I, he amazed me and, he was a truly creative human being. He took photo. He was always taking pictures. He was truly creative, and 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 like all the people in that generation, one could say uniquely unique. Um, the Jack Nicholsons, the the Hoppers. That maybe it's just the, the era we're living in, and the nostalgia and the romanticism that we have about their work. But I actually don't think so. I think they are uniquely unique. Completely agree, uh, Christopher. Any closing thoughts? No, I think Josh hit the, hit the nail right on the head, which is just keep writing. You can't do anything now anyway. The business is kind of in suspended animation a little bit. So in some ways you can get a leap on things. So uh, use your time wisely. Yep, appreciate that. Genevieve, any last thoughts for the show today? It was just really great to talk to you both. Appreciate your time very much. And there was so much good content you both shared and so much good advice for the audience thank you thank you for your time thank you Great. yeah on, be on behalf of seattle film summit and albuquerque film and music experience um so appreciative of both of you being on today and i hope the audience uh you know, got a few things out of it and it filled the void in some ways I want to make sure everybody tunes in next week um as I think the title that we're going to roll out is Lessons from Dennis Hopper on Unconventional, on unconventional Approaches to Success. So we'll see how that rolls. But we're going to have special guests on. I mentioned Satya and Nick. Uh, we're in touch with a few of uh, Dennis's friends over the years as well to join us on the show. So follow us on uh, Facebook, um, Filling the Void, and tune in for uh, previous episodes as well as this one at YouTube.com back uh, forward slash filling the void. Josh, Christopher, Genevieve, thank you, thank you, thank you. Look forward to uh, being in touch over the next few days and uh, into the future as we move through this. Everybody stay safe and um, take care of your families and continue being creative. So thank thanks you. to the audience for joining us. Thanks thank you, Ivan. sponsors again. Thanks, Genevieve. And, um, you know, thanks. Bigfoot Green Room and Eventive Ticketing. So just uh, so appreciative of both of your time. Uh, have a great, great rest of the day, everybody, and uh, be productive. Hello, my name is Lynn Shelton. I actually live in Los Angeles right now, but my soul resides in Seattle and it always shall. So uh, I was asked to make this message and I was happy to do it because I love Seattle so much. <clears throat> and I've been thinking a lot about how to keep sane during insane times um, and insane uh, times when you have a lot of time on your hands. I have an eating disorder. So uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is not just constantly stress eat. Um, and one of the ways that I've been trying to avoid stress eating is to think of ways to be creative. And I am um, by nature, creative. I tend to think in creative ways. I make movies and I direct movies and TV shows. Um, and I was trying to think about things that uplift me and one of them is being creative. I've been doing a lot of drawing and sketching lately. Um, and I thought I would also try to use this as an excuse to learn a new skill. So the skill I'm going to attempt to teach myself is how to edit movies on my phone. This is, an, I have an iPhone, so I can use a free app called iMovie, which I discovered you can download onto your phone and actually edit movies on your phone. I didn't know you could. I knew you could use that to do it on your computer, but I didn't know you could do it on your phone. Um, I, am, I would be shocked if there wasn't also an app to use on Androids. Um, 
And the other thing that really uplifts me a lot is singing. I was kind of shocked recently to rediscover how many happy hormones flooded my body uh, when I got into a bathtub and I put a song on that is a song I like to sing to. It's like in my vocal range and it's just fun to sing along to it. Doesn't matter which song because it's different. It's going to be different for everybody. And I sang really loud <laughs> and I could not believe how my mood just skyrocketed. It just went to the tippy top um, through, the, through the ceiling. And so I wanted to remind people of that. I feel like a lot of people are realizing that or tapping into that because every time I go on social media, I see a lot of people singing. But um, I, I asked a bunch of, I felt too shy to sing for you myself, but I asked a bunch of friends um, uh, to send me songs, send me pic uh, videos of songs, them singing songs that cheer them up. And I am now going to attempt to put them together. And they're pretty great. Um, so there's a little medley coming up of fun songs. And it will show you how I learned this skill of video editing. It's all done on my phone. And um, you can do it too. Because <laughs> you can take videos with your phone and then you can edit it together. And you can also require people. That's another fun thing to do is give friends assignments to send you create and send you silly videos or singing videos or dance. There's a lot of, um, I've seen there's some dance, dance challenges out there. Um, and I just want everybody to, uh, well, I'll wrap it up at the end. <laughs> I'm always walking after midnight searching for you. Glad so swift and the rain won't lift. The gate won't close and the railings off roads. Get your mind off of winter time. You ain't going nowhere. You are the sunshine of my life. That's why I'll always stay around. Peace when the day is done. Peace is for everyone. Let me sing a funny song with crazy words that roll along. And if my song can start you smiling, I'm happy, happy. Hold on, world, world, hold on. It's going to be all right. I am happy, you are happy, let us be happy together, whether the weather is cloudy or sunny, I will always be your funny honey bunny, I am lucky, you are lucky, let us get lucky together, whether the weather is cloudy or breezy, I'll be there to say, hey come on, let's take it easy, cause isn't it nice to have the friends that you do, and isn't it nice that the sky is so blue, and isn't it nice to say I love you, chugga chugga choo choo, woo woo, I am smiling, you are smiling, let us Smile together, whether the weather is cloudy or storming. I will still be there in the morning. I'll be right by your side in the morning. I hope that you like cereal. Hang in there, Seattle. I love you. <laughs>